So today I am basically going to present almost myself because I'm going to present the way I work, right? So uh, given this, um, given that uh, Nathan initially presented this as a methodological workshop, right? When where we present uh, the actual way we do reconstruction in 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 our particular fields. I, I felt that it was a good opportunity for me to show you how, how I do reconstruction, which is uh, basically neogrammarian, but with a twist. And uh, the idea is that, uh, well, uh, the comparative method can be complemented, right? So uh, if you ever work with Basque, as some of the people here or many other languages in the world, you would have probably read these famous sentences uh, Nathan mentioned uh, Meile today, right? Or also Saucier, um, I never pronounced that name well. Uh, they said that it was impossible to reconstruct Basque. And they may have a point. It's not easy, but it's certainly not impossible. But the point that they may have is that the comparative method finds most difficulty when dealing with language isolates. Not only because, I mean, yes, it's uh, difficult to reconstruct Basque, uh, Ainu, Huave, Guruchaski, whatever isolate, given that they don't have a family. But it's also complicated if we are working with um, languages with small families like Korean or Japanese or languages with mm, not not as well documented as other languages we usually work with, right? So the idea when doing um, reconstruction, uh, phonological reconstruction, is that we are dealing with sound change, basically, right? Sound correspondences, um, cognates, represent sound change. And sound change is mostly, but not only, phonology, right? So. Uh, if we just deal on phonological terms, we will be able to explain that much of a particular sound change. But then I would argue that we need of many other subdisciplines of linguistics in order to be able to give a full account of uh, a particular um, sound change. In this case, I mentioned uh, phonetics, uh, social linguistics, or, or um, contact linguistics diachrony, that would probably include philology here, and uh, typology, phonological typology, for instance. And this uh, create a number of, you know, like intersections or topics, oh, sorry, that come from, from each of those that are of interest in the study of particular sound changes, right? Particular sound changes. Those include phonological typology, sound change typology, historical phonology, phonetically based phonology, sound change in progress, contact linguistics, and so on. So, uh, I will start with an example that is not the actual focus of my talk today, but it is nevertheless important for me because it's already done and I think I was successful in working with this particular um, sound pattern. Uh, I'm talking about U fronting in Basque. What is U fronting? Well, U fronting is U, this is U, becoming U, right? And I started working on this um, particular change philologically. I went uh, to a text, uh, this is um, Onsail Secovidia, a uh, Suberum uh, Basque text from the um, 1666. And uh, what you can see here, I hope you can see it from the back, is that uh, we find two different ways of written down what in other Basque dialects is U, right? So here we find some examples in which o U is used and others in which just U is used to mark a sound that in other dialects does not need such a distinction. Well, this obviously tells us that uh, at this particular time, this particular author required of two different graphematic ways of showing um, what is reconstructed as U because it wasn't U any longer, right? But um, although philologically we can get, because we know the French tradition and so on, 
we could imagine that this represents U and this represents U, we have to actually move on to another subdiscipline of linguistics, which is phonology, to understand what's uh, behind this distribution. So, uh, what phonology tells us is that there is U and there is U, and the crucial context that um, that establishes the distribution between those two segments in Suberian language is the following consonant, right? The consonant that follows the vowel. From that, we create two sets of consonants. One of them is what I call the inhibitory context, a series of consonants that have maintained U as U, and then the rest of the consonants, which are the fronting context. If we think on phonological terms, what we could see is that um, here, right, the inhibitory context, are all coronals. But at the same time, some of the fronting context, like T, D, D, D palatals, uh, more sibilants, all those are coronals too. So it's not that easy to find a natural class that will account for this particular distribution. That's when we move on to yet another subdiscipline of linguistics, and in this case, we move on to phonetics. And phonetics can help with our process of understanding what's behind this distribution and what has conditioned this sound change. In this case, uh, we can go to, to um, um, physiological studies and find out that in order to produce these segments that we have classified as inhibitory contexts, we need to uh, use the tip of the tongue in a very fine way, right? We require fine movements of the tip of the tongue. And in order to produce those fine movements of the tip of the tongue, we have to move the tongue body backwards into the region of U and far away from the region of U. So we can observe that there is a um, co-articulatory bias that makes us um, more likely to produce U before the segments that are actually inhibitor, inhibitory segments in Basque. Uh, and that could be applied to all the languages and in this case has resulted in a particular distribution within the history of the Basque language. So now that we mostly understand what's happening here, we can move on to typology and see that in Europe, this is a map from uh, Juliet's work from probably a couple of years ago. In Europe, um, there are many languages that show U fronting, right? And they do form an area. So there is an area in Europe of languages that show U to U. Basque is actually part of this area. It's the southwesternmost language of this linguistic area that shares a um, particular sound change. What does that mean? That it is very likely that contact played a role in this particular sound pattern. Now that we do know what happened here, we have a more complete understanding, we can go back to our data and be able to produce a better analysis, a more complete account of the sound pattern understand. Right? So this is basically what I do. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that paper was published a couple of years ago, if, if you're interested in it. And uh, now, um, moving on to different, um, yet another sound pattern that is found in the history of Basque. And in this case, the sound pattern of interest is what I call nasal aspiration. So nasal aspiration is the process whereby intervocalic N becomes H, right? Here we have an example of Aquitanian, which is the oldest attested uh, variety of uh, Euskarian language, right? Attested from the first to the third century. And uh, what we see is that uh, what was written as N in the first to third century shows up as H in modern Basque, but it is produced with audible nasalization in Suburban Basque, something like saying. This is also true of reconstructed words such as nani, which is nahi in modern Basque, or uh, very old long words such as anatem, which is ahate 
Suveroan Ahate. Ahate. Right, but yeah, the phonological context of this process is clear, but what is the actual result of nasal aspiration, right? What is happening there phonologically? What is its status in the modern language? Is it still contrastive or is it not? And uh, is this sound change internal and phonetically natural and thus it could have happened at any time in the history of Basque or is it a sound change that required of contact in order to develop the way it developed in Basque? So first of all, I want to talk to you about how rare this contrast is, right? Because the sound pattern that I just described created a contrast between H and nasalized H. So this opposition is actually quite rare, cross-linguistically. If we think of the languages that have H, well, we could say that most of the languages in the world have H, right? 88% of, oh, sorry. 88% uh, of the languages in the APSID database show H. Nevertheless, the languages that possess a nasal glottal approximant, nasalized H, are much, uh, they, they are much fewer, right? We don't find so many of them. We can find that in Krim, Lisu, and Piraha, for instance. But those languages don't show an opposition between the two segments. They just show nasalized H and no oral H. Only two languages have been argued to show a clear opposition between oral H and nasalized H. And those languages are uh, Kwangali, a Bantu language of Namibia and Angola, and Seimat, an uh, Austronesian language of the Admiralty Islands. There are at least two other languages, Aguaruna and Arabella, that could be analyzable with oral versus nasalized H contrast. But the nasalized, the nasalized aspirate can be viewed as a predictable allophone of the velar nasal consonant as well, and that's the preferred analysis. So, yeah, moving on to uh, the methodology I used for this uh, research. Uh, first, I, I mean, it's a threefold methodology which is, um, which I'm going to be present here. First step is phonetic explanation, right? Uh, what, um, what this implies is that we will decompose the, the, um, the, the factors conditioning this particular sound pattern to find their um, articulatory, acoustic, and perceptual biases that may condition the outcome. In the case of uh, nasal aspiration, there has been um, research done on it since uh, already 40 years ago, and we know that there is a property of speech which is usually called rhinoglottophilia, which means that there is a relationship between uh, aspiration and nasalization, in the sense that uh, aspirated sounds can become nasalized and nasalized sounds can become aspirated. So uh, this I will talk about it uh, shortly, but yeah, we find it in many languages and so on. Second, uh, phonetic experimentation. Here we will devise uh, experiments in order to find, uh, to get acoustic and articulatory data. And uh, in some cases we will also prepare uh, more specific uh, experiments in, in involving, for instance, natural contexts to find the kind of co-articulation that we expect could have resulted in a particular bias in sound change. Of course, this can be, that this can be applied to any speaker, not necessarily speakers of Basque. We just need naive speakers that share the crucial features that are part of this sound pattern. Third, typological assessment. Uh, here, not only the um, target segment and the outcome, but also the context where these sound patterns develop are of interest. And we will look at the languages of the world and especially the languages in contact to our target language in order to find out how common this sound pattern is. If we find that this sound pattern occurred all over the world in many different places in many different ways, then we would assume that it's a phonetically natural sound pattern given that it also has a phonetic explanation. 
But if not, we may have to check whether contact played a role on this change and whether um, it was the combination of a constellation of features found in Basque and its contact language, in this case Gascon, which also shows this kind of development, but with a different outcome, which is loss of the, a of the end, uh, played a role in this particular sound pattern. So now, uh, what's the hypothesis after all that I, what I have presented now? So the hypothesis is that N was more likely to lenite than other nasal consonants in the same context. And two, that a language with nasal aspiration will have H as a category, since the interpretation of a weakened, weakened N as nasalized H suggests that H is a variant of a category already existing in the language. Why is this important? As I said, Gascon, Gascon shares the target and the context of this sound pattern, but crucially, it does not show the outcome found in Basque. And if it ever was there, it's not preserved. Basque, on the contrary, had H as a category, and H also occurred after nasal consonants, which means that was very likely assimilated in nasality to that consonant. That uh, as a consequence of that, uh, this was an allophonic category in Basque prior to the sound. Uh, yeah, I already talked about this. So um, in case that this exact sound pattern does not show up in any other language of the world, we would have to assume that two languages with the right properties were in a contact situation and that produced the sound change we just described. So, as I said, rhinoglotophilia is the phonetic connection between aspiration and nasality, and it has been uh, accounted for acoustically as well as perceptually. It has been documented in many languages, and those include, um, for instance, Thai, the Nepalese language Hayu, or Scottish Gaelic, in addition to Basque, for instance. Moving on, um, now we need to check phonetically what is actually happening here, right? We have, we have described a rhinoglobophiliac process, but we have to actually test that in the lab. Um, so we have 15 recordings from 15 towns in the Mixian region, and they were descript, the, um, recorded for dialectological description, as uh, um, found in Camino's work. And we discarded some recordings because the speakers were very old, and the recordings were also very old. So, sorry, not good enough. Um, all the recordings are l quite long, so they can be used for our research, and they were recorded with a portable recorder in, in high quality, but in a very rural situation. So there are noises, there are bells ringing, sometimes even animals. Uh, all the audio files were manually, trans manually transcribed, force aligned with the web app uh, of mouse, and um, set for Basque of France, which I, I prepared myself so it can be used in the future for other research. And uh, they were hand corrected by myself as needed. So very shortly, I uh, don't know whether I can play this, but it's not important. This is the word Behi, right? As you can see, this is the H here. And it's difficult to see because the H is really vocalic. It's very vowel-like. The same is true for Igisin, which shows a uh, etymologically nasalized age. Very vocalic. And the last one, uh, Berhaun, shows an age that was etymologically oral, but it is assimilated to a following N so that it's nasalized as a phonetic, um, as a result of uh, phonetic articulation. Right, now uh, the acoustic measurements we measured 20 uh, different um, features of speech. Why did we do that? Uh, well, because different people have used uh, especially A1 minus P0, and that's not good enough, right? The results are very variable and they don't really, they are not explanatory enough. So we went on and we developed a new methodology that used a lot of measurements. Then, uh, well, the measurements were taken in Pratt and R, and uh, then we also added MFCCs uh, for 
extra information, and all the measurements were taken at five millisecond intervals. This is not really important, this is just methodological, uh, but of the phonetic part. And well, then the, the was submitted to a principal component analysis, and we retained the PCs that explain um, 80% of the variance, which is usually 11 to 30. So we used the speaker specific models and uh, nasalized tokens uh, that are as shown here, right? Um, vowels in contact to nasal consonants always, and oral tokens with vowels in contact with uh, oral consonants as training, uh, as the training data set. So I, I don't know how much time I have or you still have 10 minutes. Okay. So, 80% um, of this data set was selected for training and we retain 20% to have, uh, to be able to compare with vowels, what we see in the ages. Uh, we apply the logistic regression models with uh, the, the principal component score as independent variables and we did that for each speaker. That's very important because each speaker is different regarding their, their, their apparatus. Um, so these are the categories we have, assimilatory nasalized age, which means as I showed you before, H that was intended to be oral but is in contact to a nasal consonant. Etymologically nasalized H, which are the H's that come from N, intervocalically, historically. Oral H, which is non-nasal. And oral vowels, which is the 20% the that we retained from the training uh, data set. And the only thing that's really important for you, because I'm afraid I may have lost some of you now, this is the only thing that's important. The midpoint, marks what's nasal and what's oral in our uh, model. Everything above 05 is nasal, everything below 05 is oral. This is how it looks like in a word, okay? So this is Ihautericom of the carnival, and you can see that this is the middle of the graphic more or less. So the vowels following the nasalized H are really, really um, high. The nasalized H is absolutely high, and then the ones preceding are variable, but with nasalization. If you compare th them to the vowels that follow T or R, they are below the midpoint of this graphic. Okay? So now let's go to the... Ah, well, if anyone is really interested in all these uh, stats and the methodology, uh, it's, it's right now it's, it's not under review any longer. It's already under revisions. Uh, hopefully it will be published soon. And all the training data as well as all the code can be found online if anyone has who wants to apply it to a different data set of any given language. So the global results. Um, we aggregated the results and uh, we now we have two nasal categories, as I said, assimilatory nasalized H and etymologically nasalized H, and two oral categories, oral H and oral vowels. And these are the results. Okay, uh, this is the midpoint, which means above is nasal, below is oral, okay? Now, the first half of the, of the graphic. This is the training data. For this particular data set, this is as oral as it gets, and this is as nasal as it gets, okay? Uh, it was done, as I said, with vowels that were unambiguously oral and unambiguously nasal, and that's the best the model can get. And now, the rest. Here we have assimilated nasalized H, which means that it was etymologically oral, but the contextual assimilation has produced clear nasalization because it's way above the line. This is the H's that historically come from N, right? So they are usually not written down as anything special in Basque, but they are clearly and ambiguously nasal. So we have a, a nasalized H here, right, phonetically. These are the oral H's. This is a very interesting thing. I will talk about it later on because we would imagine that those should be closer to oral vowels. Well, they're not. They are close to the midpoint, below the midpoint, but eh, really close to it. It's not unambiguously oral or nasal. It's something in between. And 
the oral vowels, which are close to the training data, as we should expect, because they should be unambiguously oral. The difference here is non-significant, so we can actually create a group between those two categories. But the difference between the, difference between the oral vowels and the oral age is actually significant. Also, very importantly, the difference between those two groups is significant as well. This means that we can separate nasalized age from the rest, but at the same time, there is a difference between um, oral age and oral vowels. And we should look further into that to figure out what's happening here. So, this mess is each of the speakers that I put in the analysis today. We have four more, but I didn't have the time to put them in the analysis yet. And what we can see here is that for most of the speakers, the trend is maintained, but not for all of them. For instance, this speaker does not assimilate the age in assimilatory context. So it does, man it does have a category which is etymologically nasalized age, but the assimilation which I previously assumed to be to be um, common to all speakers, that's not occur in this case. That's news, but it's interesting. Then uh, some speakers show a more clear difference, okay? Uh, this one, for instance, is very interesting because all his or her ages are nasal, all of them. This is also the case for this one and uh, not for the rest, right? In this case, um, this has lost etymologically nasalized age, and as I said, this does not assimilate, but most of them do have etymologically nasalized age, and two of them nasalized all the ages. This might seem surprising, but it goes in line with an observation by Iñaki Camino that maybe Julian has read, who said that this opposition is actually merging there is a merge in progress. So I did find some evidence for the loss of the opposition between nasalized age and age, and it is very interestingly, because historically it was the other way around for the rest of the Basque dialects, they are merging in favor of the nasalized age. So oral age is becoming nasalized as a means of enhancing the aspiration with nasalization, and that's again Rhino Glorophilia. Um, right. Uh, yeah, so this, I mean, I didn't talk with Iñaki Camino about this, but he will probably be happy because that's what he heard and his impressionistic uh, transcriptions of uh, these speakers show the same that I have observed instrumentally. Yeah, so we, are, we have started to understand what's happening with age um, in the modern language, we have seen the fine detail that we can infer that has historical consequences, and now we can go back in time and look at, which is pos possibly more familiar to you, um, correspondences and um, the influence of different assimilatory sound patterns in uh, how we reconstruct the phonetic properties of a proto segment, right? In this case, uh, going on with H, we have observed how vocalic it was in the modern language, right? Everything was very vocalic and looked like vowels. Well, if we look at this set of words, we would see that where internal H and initial H both produce the voicing of V to F, and, and, um, and U produce labialization of H and H also to F. This sound pattern, which um, was uh, described in less detail, but was already described by Walder some years ago, uh, lets us infer that um, at some point in time, older intervocalic age was produced <coughs> not as modern age and nasalized age, like a voiced approximate like segment, but a real fricative. It was voiceless and it was uh, different to the modern age because it added its uh, devoicing um, quality to voice segments in order to produce this uh, first fricative of the Basque language. This is already, I mean, this is after Common Basque. So we are not talking about the 
the stage that uh, Juliet has been presented today. This is sometime, let's say, the middle, uh, the middle of the Middle Ages. But we do know more about it, and maybe we could go back in time, and it would still be the case that age was fricative-like at those points in time, and not as it is now. So, yeah, we now we reconstruct a voicing process of age between vowels and sonorants. Uh, right, this has implications too for our first statement that M became H intervocalically. The usual reconstruction that I, I assumed until now, and I think Igartua assumes, implies a rhinoglophiliac process such as intervocalic N becoming a voiced nasalized H. But uh, if it is the case that it was voiceless at some point in time, we may have to assume something like this, a more lenitive process that has a different intermediate point. Well, I'm not actually completely sure about this, but I do think that uh, the need of this stage conditions our middle steps of the reconstruction of this particular sound pattern, because now we have evidence for this middle step that we didn't have before voiceless intervocalic nasalized age. So as conclusions, uh, yeah, we get a better general understanding of the result and context of the reconstructed sound patterns involved in phonetic, phonology, typology, and the role of contact. And uh, the reconstruction of, of some sound patterns can be revised once we understand fully what's happening around them. And also we have found some evidence that we were not initially looking for, but uh, it was already mentioned by, by uh, dialectology, um, dialectologist work, and we found evidence for it, so now we have something else to research. Uh, thanks a lot.